When I was 27, the most important thing for me to do was go for this one particular mammogram. The week before, I had learned that I carried a mutation, an inherited mutation, on my BRCA1 gene. Every human in the world has two BRCA1 genes, one from their mom, one from their dad. And when these genes work properly, they're part of the body's natural defense against tumor formation. But in a person like me, with an inherited broken copy of one of these genes, my risk of developing breast and ovarian cancer was grossly elevated. So when I got my test results, I wanted to go right in and get checked out. This was so important to me that I kept the appointment, even though that morning my dad called me and told me that his dad, my grandfather, had died. When I roll up to the radiology lab, the receptionist seems to be having trouble finding my appointment in the computer. And eventually, she looks at me and in this kind of accusatory tone says, well, how old are you? And I said, well, I'm, I'm 27. And she said, oh, we don't give mammograms to women under 30. And I thought, this can't be right. I'd had many mammograms before, because that's what you do when you grow up in a family like mine. Clearly, it's the 80s here. You can tell from the fashion. Um, but this is me on a camping trip with my parents. And my mom, as you can see, is wearing a turban um, because she's in the middle of treatment for breast cancer, diagnosed at age 30. And my mom was not surprised to be diagnosed with breast cancer, because this is her mom's family. On the upper right hand, that's my grandmother, Meg. Uh, on the left, her eldest sister, Trudy. Trudy probably developed breast cancer in her late 20s, and she was a nurse and knew what was happening to her, but the only treatment available at the time was a super extreme mastectomy, and that scared her, so she delayed treatment. So she was dead at 31 of breast cancer. In the middle, we've got my great aunt, Elle. Elle was also a nurse. And so she knew what was happening when in her 30s she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And she remembered what had happened to her sister and ran right out and had her breasts cut off. And uh, she had some other treatment as well. She survived the breast cancer, but about a decade and a half later she developed ovarian cancer. And as you might know, ovarian cancer is a really lethal kind of cancer. Even today, with the medical advances we've made, it kills more than 50% of women diagnosed with it within five years. So Elle died in her 50s of ovarian cancer. Then we come to my grandmother, the youngest of the sisters. She had cancer in one breast in her 30s, and then in the other breast in her 40s, and then ovarian cancer in her 50s. And it's still kind of a miracle to me that she survived. But the receptionist didn't ask me about any of this. I tried to explain. I said, but my mom got cancer at 30, and I have a BRCA1 mutation, the same one that my mother and grandmother have. And she just looked at me and said, no exceptions. And I turned around, and I started crying <laughs> as I left the facility. That receptionist was treating me like the average patient that she sees. But I'm not the average patient. I'm actually a mutant, like a bona fide genetic mutant. <laughs> and my risk is much, much higher than average. Just to put a few numbers to this, um, this is a chart that looks at breast and ovarian cancer in the ordinary woman, like the average woman, and then a woman with a BRCA1 mutation. So the average woman has about a 12% chance of developing breast cancer in the course of her lifetime. That's about a one in eight chance. A woman with a BRCA1 mutation has somewhere between a 55 and 65% chance of developing breast cancer during her lifetime. So chances are better than a coin, winning a coin flip. For ovarian cancer, the difference is even more stark. The average woman has a less than 2% chance of developing ovarian cancer, but a woman like me has something like a 40% chance. There are also some biological differences um, in, in terms of when cancer di is diagnosed and what, what strain of cancer is diagnosed. So the average age of breast cancer diagnosis for the average woman is 61. There aren't really good numbers on what it is for a BRCA1 woman. 
Um, all I had to go on was, of course, my family history, which is admittedly a tiny, statistically insignificant sample size. But the average age in my family was about 34. That experience at the receptionist's desk was my first experience being treated like a crazy person by the medical establishment. And uh, unfortunately, I had that experience over and over again as I began dealing with this condition in earnest. In fact, I came to believe that the medical industry as a whole was playing some kind of sadistic mind game with me. I'd been told that I had this extraordinary level of risk, but whenever I tried to do something about it, I couldn't be sure of whether I would be treated like a hypochondriac or like a rational woman who had done her homework and read a bunch of medical papers. When I went in for the mammogram, I was doing something called surveillance, which is one of the main treatment options available to women in my shoes. It is just what it sounds like. It aims not at reducing your cancer risk, but at catching cancer when it's like a little fluffy bunny and before it becomes Voltron. Because <laughs> if I had to meet somebody in a dark alley, I would choose the, the baby bunny personally. At the time, the recommendation for women like me was to go in twice a year and get this barrage of tests to your breasts and to your ovaries. And I thought this sounded like no big deal, right? Like I go in one day in the fall and one day in the spring, scan, 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 and then I don't have to think about it for six months. The reality, however, was far, far from simple. Uh, every six months, I was supposed to have a pelvic exam, like a physical pelvic exam, a transvaginal ultrasound where they use sound waves to look inside your body, and a blood test. And to scan for breast cancer, I was supposed to have a mammogram alternating with an MRI every six months, a breast MRI, and then a physical breast exam. It is not possible to get all of those scans in one day or even at the same facility. So I had to patch together my medical treatment. Before I had been diagnosed with a BRCA1 mutation, I had been a healthy 27-year-old newlywed. And after the diagnosis, I became somebody who went to the doctor more than 10 times a year to check for a cancer that I didn't have yet. I was definitely caught between the worlds of sick and healthy. Eventually, I was able to go in for a mammogram, and I went to the same place that had refused me the first time. And they found something in one of my breasts. And they sent me for an ultrasound, and afterward the doctor came and talked to me and said, like, it's probably fine, but we're going to follow standard procedure and send your films to another pathologist for a second opinion. You'll get the official results in the mail for two weeks. For the next two weeks, I was on pins and needles. You know, I'm dragging this parade of family ghosts behind me wherever I go, and I'm living with that paranoia that many women feel about becoming my mother in this one specific and really terrible way. Eventually, results resu arrive in the mail, and when I open the envelope, I'm a little surprised, because um, I really had wanted a definitive answer, like, yes, I'm fine, no, I'm not fine, something that would make the path forward more clear. But this is what the results looked like. <laughs> so, like, it's really great that that bottom box, like, you definitely have cancer, come on in, uh, isn't checked. But it's, it's more than a little unsettling that <laughs> the top two boxes were also not checked. And when I opened this letter, I mean, horror just rolled over me. I'd been through this emotionally draining barrage of tests where I constantly had to argue for myself to get a medical care that was considered standard for women in my shoes. And the only assurance that I was getting was probably benign. And I just imagine doing that same thing every six months until, what, until I get cancer? That was the moment I decided I could not do breast cancer surveillance, that it, I was just done. <laughs> Luckily for me, there are other options available to women with BRCA mutations. Unfortunately, the main other option does involve surgery to remove breasts or ovaries, or both. And uh, I don't know about you, but I prefer to keep myself in mint condition, you know, with original parts and packaging. Um, but eventually, my fear and my dread of cancer surveillance outweighed my desire to not have surgery. 
So at age 28, I had a preventative double mastectomy with reconstruction, or as I sometimes like to think of it now, I earned my ultimate hipster cred. Um, you know, I did the Angelina Jolie, but like before Jolie, so. <laughs> and doing that lowered my risk of developing breast cancer by 90%. So that means my risk of developing breast cancer is now lower than that of the average woman. I've learned a lot by having so many interactions with the medical system. And though hopefully uh, none of you have the same kind of genetic issue that I do, it's very likely that you'll face an unusual medical event in the course of your lifetime. And if it doesn't happen to you, it might, it probably will happen to somebody you know and love. So I've got some advice. The first is to be your own advocate. If you don't do it for yourself, who will? Part of being a good advocate for yourself is doing your homework, doing your research. You know, I was able to get that mammogram because I knew what the surveillance protocol was for women in my shoes, and I was able to um, make a case for it. I knew that, that it was the medical facility that was wrong, not me. So be your own advocate and be an informed advocate. It's also vital, if you can, to go and see a specialist. Specialists are experts, and they know quite a lot about the nuances of treatment. They also stay up to date on what the most current science is. Medical research is running really fast, and there are many wonderful gen general practitioners in the world, but there's just not enough human brain power to keep up to date on everything. There's also a really underrated uh, element of going to a specialist, and that is that you might be their average patient, so you don't have to do as much advocacy work there quite often. Oh, one more thing about finding a specialist is that it's okay to shop around a little bit. You know, you wouldn't marry the first tw Tinder match you make. You'd at least look at a few more photos, maybe hop on the internet and check them out a little bit. Same thing goes for specialists. Lastly, remember that it's your body and you're the one who has to live with the consequences. These days, doctors quite frequently present many medical options to their patients and which one you choose should be the one that's right for you. You know, what, what is tolerable to me might not be tolerable to my mother, for example. I'm still undergoing medical surveillance because I still have my ovaries every six months, like clockwork. But through my experience with my mastectomy, I feel that I've come to understand um, what I need from the medical system better. When I moved to this new city, I, uh, I, went to a new, I went to a new doctor. I needed to find a new place for my care. And I knew I was in the right place because the nurse navigator took me into a little room, sat me down, looked me in the eye, and she said, tell me your story, start from the beginning. And she really, really listened. And after that, she popped open a window on her computer and she referred me to a specialist. Thank you.